Hi there, I'm Justine Rogers from UNSW Law. I wish I could be there with you at this Humanity of Lawyers event and in the cloistered grandeur of the inns and nearing winter no less. That would be so dreamy from my um, home and away conditions. For my DPhil research, I undertook an ethnographic study of pupil barristers. I spent just over three months in London at three sets of chambers, one commercial chancery, one criminal and one family. I investigated barristers' modes of selection and socialisation, embodied in pupillage, or the barrister's apprenticeship, and the pupils' experiences of it. Widely known as a year-long interview, and as the chamber's test for tenancy, pupillage is a uniquely pressurised form of training. It retains traces of classical rites of passage in which neophyte, neophytes are ground down to be fashioned anew. What I hadn't anticipated was that I would gain access to such an intense and interlinked world and afforded such rich insights to the humanity of barristers. I too might have been beguiled by their wigs and, and other symbols of status. But I got to observe the workings of their knowledge and ethics, their emotions, their fears, and the ways in which these involved clashes for individuals between their personal and professional identities, roles, and beliefs. This is a very human job. I'm going to give you some examples of how the barristerial life is both enabling and fulfilling, as well as onerous and sometimes even very damaging. Firstly, the emotions. Becoming a barrister is actually a very emotional transition. Now, barristers like extended metaphors. They can be rather dramatic, and there, but there was, I have to say, something in it in the description given by one of the pupils who said that pupillage is like a cross-country run with a porcelain vase in a sealed box that you have to carry and you can only open it after you finish. And for all you know, you broke the vase on day one. But while impressing the pupil supervisor is vital for pupils, the judge is the centre of the barrister's universe. And many pupils told me that facing the judge for the first time was the biggest trauma of pupillage. Waiting to enter the court, one pupil said to me, oh, it's fine, it's better just to do it. It's just that there's something about being in front of a judge that makes you less natural than you would be with friends or colleagues and the client. I just need to say, this is what we're asking for and why. And that's what I'm getting used to, being natural in front of the judge. This pupil ended up being severely reprimanded by the judge for not having a document signed. And to the client, she said that being shouted down, no big deal. But to me, she said, a big part of the job is willing to be humiliated, to stand up and give it a go. But I'm a perfectionist and I don't like being embarrassed in front of people. During my research, I wondered if female pupils were disproportionately affected by these sorts of interactions with the judge. But male pupils also found it very uncomfortable and obsessed over any critical comments the judges made. Though I have to say in less prolonged and personal terms, or perhaps they were just less willing to talk about, it, talk about that with me in that way. But pupils learn or start to believe that the system involves a degree of emotional detachment, of course, to deal with the judge, but also with the client. One of the most vivid interactions was with a commercial pupil after watch or, watching a trial with him, which was quite rare. It was a contempt of court action against a mentally unwell man breaching an order not to enter his former workplace. On our way to Chambers, the pupil said to me that he was surprised at how, in his words, ruthless and nightmarish the senior was with the defendant during the cross-examination. I remarked, yeah, I felt quite sorry for the defendant who would probably find it very difficult to start his life again. And the pupil said, without missing a beat, you can't feel sorry for the client if you're going to do your job properly. In other contexts, the barrister may have to present to the client overt emotional displays, such as sympathy, indignation and courage. Like the suppression of genuine emotions, the performance of appropriate emotions requires practice. A family junior provided the example of a father's custody dispute case that she'd taken over and had been going on for four years. She said that the client was furious at having supervised contact with his child only and that he'd been through different judges, experts and representation. She said she quickly realised that she had to show sympathy for his situation and to display to him through her language and her manner that his case was important to her and that she was willing to fight for him and thereby allow him some catharsis. But, she added, barristers still need some suppression of emotion to keep the client calm and focused. The use of strategic sympathy that might of course involve some real feelings and suppression 
allowed her to present what she called an authoritative presence, which also helped conceal from him the very little information she'd actually received from the clients about his case. A criminal barrister has to deal with people the most and the most often. The pupils have about five hearings a day, often for very little money. I saw them yelled at, spat at, um, or by the clients, I should say, not the judge, and in cells with much older people than they were, usually men with drug and mental health problems. On the way to meet the client's wife, uh, one of the pupils said to me that this was the most tiring and difficult parts of pupillage, having to deal with all these people. In this way, becoming a barrister involves opposite processes of being both more and less human. Secondly, ethics. Now, some of what I've just described overlaps with ethics or the, the moral dimensions of being a barrister. And the pupils struggled with the demands and tensions of their new role. Just one example in my field notes was of one of the criminal pupils coming back to Chambers to say that she was excited that she had just succeeded in a bail application for her client who had been accused of a serious robbery. A junior teased her saying, when you get bail, the joke's on you and they do something worse while they're on bail. Uh -uh. And the pupil nervously laughed and then neutralized it by saying, well, then you just say, I was just doing my job. So there are paradoxes of the barristerial role, the virtuous, fearless advocate, the dry, morally detached, mere agent, the isolation, and then these intense relationships and the high levels of cooperation they need in order to do their job with their colleagues in and outside chambers, solicitors, the client, the judge, a myriad others, court staff, ushers, you know, other related services. Barristers need to be able to engage with people, often very quickly and decisively. Finally, their fears. The life of a barrister involves profound insecurity about not being right or competent. Now, this doesn't change, though it becomes more manageable. Indeed, part of the task of pupillage is to be able to master these feelings and to develop not just competence, but what the literature calls the cloak of competence, or the projection of supreme confidence and efficacy. As some of the pupils said, what helps is handling, in handling this fear of being wrong or being seen as wrong, is realizing that everyone uses the professional face to manage the role. One said, everyone's winging it. So another deep fear is not being liked. But one of the pupil supervisors pointed out to me that being a barrister means getting used to not being liked. He said, you need to be, it's about being right rather than liked. You need to be able to tell your solicitor to F off if you think they're being unethical, such as acting in a way that is prejudicial to the client's interest. The solicitor is client facing, the barrister is court facing. Your duty is to tell the client what the judge will say. So being right, not liked is what matters. Now, a third and final ma major anxiety I'm going to talk about is being forced to change. Since the Thatcher reforms of the late 80s, barristers have had to undergo immense changes to their ideologies, privileges and status, their identities and practice arrangements, much of which, at least at first, was strongly resisted. And this is all st built, still being played out. This situation of change involves a mixture of positive and negative outcomes for the bar and their different sectors. But overall, the barristers have taken this barrage of criticism and change to heart. In fact, what struck me during my time at the bar was a certain lack of confidence among them. As one senior junior put it, there's certainly a flavor that we're running scared, that we're constantly under attack. So a profound dislike and fear of being wrong, not liked and forced to change, I'd say these are pretty common human experiences. And as a final comment about the humanity of barristers and my time researching them, I observed that barristers and their pupils tend to be dedicated, conscientious, methodical, and highly self-disciplined individuals. One clerk compared them to sports cars, finely tuned, better than the rest, but also liable to break down. The barristers I observed were very generous when speaking to me, giving serious thought to the issues I asked them about. They were often witty and great company. Still, they typically have that unnerving skill of being at the same time polite and stern, if not a tad prickly. <laughs> and they may make jokes about their limited ethical role, but the barrister's duties to the court and to the client, to be honest, fearless, independent and honourable, remain sources of intense pride and distinction. I'll leave it there for you, for your live discussion. Thank you for having me and I'll be watching online.